We lift up to you our brother Ryan this morning and ask you to um, put your words in his heart increasingly as he speaks, that you would be at work. We know that you're eager to be at work and that you would guide him and help him. We also pray that we would have listening ears and soft hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Yeah, as Robin said, I just got home Friday from Hawaii, so the weather was nice. I'll claim that I brought the warm weather back. That's why it's nice now, right? No, I don't have that kind of power. Uh, yeah, so the, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Pastor Ryan, and I oversee uh, what we call our Go ministry, which is both the things we do locally, mission-wise, as well as with our partnerships overseas. And then uh, I work alongside Robin uh, to oversee our microchurches, our small expressions of, of the church um, that we do during the week. So that's a little bit about what I do here. And today, I get the joy of talking about how Jesus calls us and sends us. He calls us to join him and be part of the mission that he has for us. And then he sends us out to do that. And I just want to encourage you as we go through this, following the call of God on your life is the most fulfilling, rewarding adventure you could ever choose for yourself. Sometimes I think as Christians, we don't talk about this enough. We kind of, and we kind of leave this impression for those that don't follow Jesus that, you know, oh, Christianity, that's, that's boring, right? You just, you have to follow a bunch of rules and it's just like, it's kind of like a killjoy religion. Why would I want to be part of that? No, doing the things that God created and put within you and gave you the abilities and calls you to do is the most fulfilling, joy-filled thing you could do with your life. It doesn't mean it's easy, as we're going to see in the passage. Uh, sometimes you actually face extreme difficulties in doing the very things that God has called you to do. But I can tell you this, nothing is more rewarding, nothing is more life-giving than saying yes to the, to the call that Jesus has placed on your life. Okay, and we'll get into a little bit about why and how and how that all comes together and what that might look like and how do you discern all this and all that. We'll get into that. But I just, I really want to encourage you in that. I think it's important to say, and I don't think we say it enough in the church. So hear that. Following Jesus and saying yes to the call he has on your life will be the best decision you ever make. Okay, so today in our passage... Uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to chapter 10, verse 42. And Jesus calls and sends out his disciples. All right? So that's where we're going to hang out today. And so if you have uh, your Bible with you, uh, feel free to open it up and follow along, whether that's your phone version or uh, the paper version like this. Doesn't matter. Uh, we're going to start in chapter 9, verse 35. And it says this. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Okay. So the first thing Jesus says to those that he's uh, called to himself in this passage is he says, pray for more workers. Pray for more workers. Workers for what? Well, he says, to be sent out into the harvest field. So, this is, this is a bit of a metaphor, right? 
Because you're like, Jesus, why do we need more farmers? Like, what, yeah, we need more workers in the harvest field. Like, what's this about? We need more farmers? Like, is there a shortage or something? No, Jesus is using a metaphor, and the harvest that he's talking about is a harvest of people. And what he's saying here is there are so many people who would say yes to choosing to follow me. That's the harvest. He says the harvest is plentiful. There are so many people who would like to say yes to following me. But there's not enough workers to go and share that message. There's not enough workers to go and live out that message, to show people the love of God tangibly and to use their words to explain the love of God that God has for them and what, Jesus, what, I, what I am calling them to, to follow me. There's not enough people to go and say yes to that calling. This is what Jesus is saying. And so he's saying, so pray that God would raise up more workers, that God would call more people to go out and do this. Pray for this, right? Uh, And and sometimes as a pastor um, and working in our microchurches, Robin can relate to this, when we need more leaders or more people to do these kinds of things, the first thing we start doing is devising what is our strategy, right? How can I get people to do this? And, and maybe, maybe we could do like a volunteer drive or, we, you know, like we come and we devise all these strategies. And then we go, wait a minute. What if I just like stopped and prayed? And so there was one time recently, actually, uh, where Robin and I did this. We, we were needing like some more people to lead some microchurches, and we tried lots of strategies and ideas, and we were just like, I don't know. We're kind of at our wits end here. Maybe we should pray. Crazy that pastors didn't think that was the first strategy, right? But hey, we're humans. Um, and so we just stopped, and we prayed, and the very next day, We had a bunch of people from a microchurch come and say, like, you know, God's been stirring in our hearts lately that, you know, maybe we should still be relational with one another, but that we should actually uh, go out and each of us lead our own microchurch. We're like, wow, God really does provide. And so this is what what Jesus encourages them. He says, pray for more workers. Pray for more workers. So one of the things, though, when we pray for things is sometimes, if you follow Jesus for very long, we we realize that sometimes we end up being the answer to our own prayer, right? So here's a question I want to ask you is, are you a worker? Are you a worker in God's kingdom? Have you said yes to joining him in the mission that he has of sharing the good news of what Jesus did? And the kingdom that he's bringing, a kingdom of holistic human thriving, this word shalom that we use, right? The Jewish word that's like this holistic thriving of humans, spiritually, physically, you know, economically, you name it. The gospel is good news. Are you a worker that shares and participates in this reality? Have you said yes to that call on your life? So that's something that I want you to think about is, have I myself said yes to being a worker? Because sometimes it's possible even to have gone through the whole church experience, you know, since you were little, you you said you've gone to church and you've been part of church and, you know, I try to follow the rules and I go on, I go fairly regularly on Sundays, you know, I got this whole being a Christian thing down. But if you haven't said yes to joining Jesus on mission, Sorry, you don't have it down. Because that's actually what God is calling us to, is to join him. Jesus was all about living on mission and sharing this message of the kingdom with people. It's what he did and lived constantly. So if we are to be a follower of Jesus, it means we need to do likewise. It means we, we need to do likewise. It's not just about following rules and and meeting a few religious qualifications, like showing up on a Sunday. No, that's not what it's about. It's so much better than that. So much better than that. 
So are you a worker? That's something to think about. Have I given my yes to this? And here's the other thing that we need to think about in this whole idea of being a worker, is that to take up Jesus' call, you must have the same spirit that he had, a spirit of love and compassion. We just read that, right? It says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. He had compassion on them, and not just compassion where, oh man, I feel sorry for them. No, compassion that led to action because it said he began to heal them, right? It's action-based compassion where he says, man, these people need healing in all kinds of different ways. I'm going to show up and provide that. So if we're going to say yes to the call of Jesus, we need to have that same sense of love and compassion in our hearts for our fellow human beings. But being a follower of Jesus, it actually compels us to then go and join the work because as we've experienced the love of God in our own life, we feel compelled that we would want others to experience the same. Okay? So, then, if we get into chapter 10, it says that he called his 12 disciples to him. So he calls 12 disciples to him, and he gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Now, this is really important to understand. If you are a follower of Jesus you have authority given to you by Jesus. That same Holy Spirit that was in Jesus, that raised Jesus from the dead, that allowed him to do all these miraculous things, if you've said yes to Jesus, that same Spirit is in you. And now you have authority to do things like pray for healing and pray that people would have freedom, Pray for all kinds of different things and to actually have the authority given to you by Jesus that these miraculous things could actually happen through you praying for these things. That same authority is in you. Do not miss this. It's not, you know, I don't have authority because, you know, Ryan's awesome and he's done all these things and studied. No, I, I have no authority based on me and myself and who I am. My authority comes from saying yes to Jesus. And any awesome thing that I've got to be a part of in God's kingdom is because of that authority, because of that spirit that lives in me, and it's the same for you. And so, as we're going to see then, I want us to, to, to learn a little bit about what were these, who were these 12, okay? That's where we're going to hang out next. Who were these 12 that Jesus sent out? So let's, let's listen, okay? Uh, these are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon, the zealot. And Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Okay, so there's a few things I want us to understand about these 12. First of all, all 12 of them were people that the religious leaders of the day, the rabbis, the teachers of the law, had rejected. You guys aren't good enough to be follow a rabbi. You guys aren't good enough uh, to be the disciples of a rabbi. You guys go back to being a part of your, your family's business, because often you would follow in the footsteps and, and your father would pass down the business to you, and so you would learn and kind of apprentice under them, and then you would take over the business. And so that's where Jesus finds a lot of them, right? Working as fishermen, um, or some of them tax collectors, or various things. So they're, they're, they're regular people that the religious uh, leaders didn't think were good enough to be leaders within the religious organization, right? Like, you guys aren't good enough just go do your thing over here, and we'll take these people that we think are good enough, and we'll train them. So, if you're a person that thinks you're not good enough, great! <laughs> Jesus can use you, right? So that's the first thing we need to recognize. These are regular people that a lot of other people 
who thought they knew what it meant to follow God thought weren't good enough. Okay, so that's, that's the first thing. But the other thing that we need to recognize is there are people that within this group, if they had met in any other way, would not have got along. Okay? So, Matthew, for example, is a tax collector. Well, who was he collecting taxes for? The Romans, who were occupying them. Now, we see there's another guy called Simon the Zealot. Well, what were zealots? Zealots were people that were trying to lead a revolt against Rome to kick the Romans out, and were sometimes violent in the ways that they would go about that. So, in actuality, if Simon the Zealot met Matthew in another situation, might have killed him, like legitimately might have killed him right? Ah, my chance to get rid of one of those scum tax collectors. My day has arrived. I'll look good for all the other zealots when I get rid of this guy, right? Like, like seriously, they, he might have killed him if he met him in any other thing. But here's the incredible thing. The gospel can unite those who would otherwise be enemies, Right? following Jesus. There's something about following Jesus and having that same Holy Spirit in us that can unite people that otherwise, had they met in any other circumstance, would have been enemies. That is really cool that the gospel can do that, bring people together that otherwise wouldn't have got along and bring them together not only to, to be in relationship with one another, but actually to serve alongside one another and be on the same team. Right? So, you heard that I was, I was away to do soccer. Uh, there, there's a friend of mine who works uh, with Eden in our apartment ministry church planning that we do with uh, Nolan and Emily and Tom and Chris, and his name's Bill Hogg. And Bill Hogg is a Manchester United fan. Now, if you don't know anything about soccer, I'll give you a little education. Uh, I'm a Liverpool fan. Manchester United and Liverpool, bitter rivals, okay? Right? And so I often joke around with Bill that, it, that only the gospel could make a Liverpool fan and, and a Manchester United fan friends, right? And actually, in England, that might be true, right? Like, bitter rivals, but we can get together the gospel. That's, that's just a fun little playful thing. But in this case, in, in, in the gospel of Matthew, it's actually legit true. They would have been legit enemies otherwise. Pretty crazy. So I want to say this to you before we get into what they were called to go do here. I want to say this. The only qualification for being a worker is saying yes to Jesus and his call. He can use you. He has wired you the way that you are on purpose. Not by mistake. So he can use you. So any excuse that, oh, I'm not qualified enough, or I don't have enough training, or I don't really have that many skills, I'm not really good at anything, nah, not buying it. Jesus created you the way that he did on purpose and has purpose for you. The other thing I want us to recognize as we jump into this is that calling, oops, I'm one ahead of myself, calling is an invitation. Jesus invites them to come follow him. In fact, what you'll notice if you read through the whole gospel of Matthew is that there are actually people who say no to the invitation, right? We have the rich young ruler, and, and Jesus calls him and says, hey, but if you choose to follow me, it's going gonna, it's gonna to mean some sacrifices for yourself. You're going to have to start, stop using your money all just for yourself and start using it to help those that are poor. And he's like, whoa, hold on, Jesus. Nope. No, thank you. I like my money a little too much. Hard pass. And he walks away. And Jesus doesn't say, oh, just kidding, rich young ruler. You don't really have to make that sacrifice. You don't really have to uh, stop using your money for your selfish reasons. It's okay. You don't really have to care for the poor. No, Jesus says, okay, that's your choice. Calling is an invitation. Jesus doesn't force it upon anybody. He invites you to come and join him in his mission. Okay? So, what does he say about the mission? 
Well, these 12 he sent out, and he gives them these, the following instructions. He says, he first of all limits where they're about to go. He says, don't go among the Gentiles and, and the Samaritans. He says, no, like, just stay here amongst, let's start here with those that are around us, the, the Israelite people who you know. Later on, we'll see that they are sent out to the Gentiles and the Samaritans. But he says, let's just start where you already know. Let's just start here. And as you go, he says, preach the message, the kingdom of heaven is near. And then he says, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. He says, freely that you've received, so freely give. Okay, so he says, so there's an act of generosity, of healing in holistic, in all kinds of holistic ways that accompanies the message of the gospel. People are set free. And he says, hey, don't, you don't need to take along gold or silver or copper in your belts. He says, no. He's like, I'm going to provide. He says, take no bag for the journey or extra tunic or sandals or a staff for the worker is worth his keep. He says, hey, if you choose to follow me, don't worry. I'll provide for you. And he says, then whatever town you go to, he's like, find somebody and stay with them. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. And if not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you, listen, listen to your words, shake up the dust of your feet, and when you leave that home or town, he says, I tell you the truth, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. So he says, like, look, if people don't accept you, don't worry about it, don't sweat it. Le- leave that up to God. Uh, you know, God, God is the judge. Leave that up to him. Just continue on. Go to other people that are willing to receive you. <clears throat> so, this is an important part I want you uh, to hear now, down in, in verse 17. He warns them that choosing to follow him sometimes might come with a cost. He says, be on your guard against men. They will hand you over to the local councils and flog you in their synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, don't worry about what you're going to say. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. He says, brother will betray brother to death and father and child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me. Ooh, sign me up for that. (laughs) Right? So Jesus doesn't pull any punches. He says, hey, sometimes if you choose to follow me, you say yes to the mission, it'll be hard. It will be hard. When you're persecuted in one place, he says, flee to another place. Okay, so this is important to understand. If we're going to follow Jesus, sometimes it will come with hard things. Sometimes the calling will be tested. Do I really trust God in this? Because it seems like I'm facing a lot of opposition. That's why it's important to, to, to know clearly what God is calling you to and, and to stay strong to then to that calling. Okay. But he says, he, further down, let's, let's go to... Um, Verse 28, he says, Do not be afraid, though, of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. He says, Are are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet one of them will not fall to the ground apart from the will of your father? He says, Hey, don't be afraid of them. He's like, Yeah, they, they might even try to. And some people, some followers of Jesus have lost their life for choosing to follow him. He said, But don't be afraid of that, because... Your soul is secure. Your soul is secure. You know that you're going to be with me in eternity, so you don't need to be afraid even of death. He says, whoever acknowledges me before man, I'll also acknowledge him before the Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before man, I will also disown him before my Father. Okay. Um. The last thing I want to say is this from this passage. If we go down, 
verse 40. He says, he who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives the one who sent me. Anyone who sees a pro- receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And anyone who receives a righteous man because he is a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. Here's the last thing I want us to understand. Sometimes God calls us to things that seem small. They don't seem like a big deal, giving a cup of cold water to somebody, letting somebody stay um, at your house for the night, whatever it might be. And they seem small or insignificant, but the cool thing about God's kingdom is God has a bigger picture in mind, right? And sometimes the things that seem small or trivial or not a big deal, or sometimes you're like, come on, God, I could give more than that, end up being the very things that have incredible kingdom impact. See, humans, we get hung up a lot on results. And we think success is results-based. But God, God has a bigger picture. He can see all of history all at once. He, he has a bigger picture in mind of what he's doing, right? And so sometimes what looks like failure in humans' eyes actually in God's eyes, is incredible success. And sometimes it's actually the opposite, too. Sometimes what looks like success, the result, we got the result we thought we wanted to get, if it's actually done in disobedience to what God's asking of us, is failure. Because God, how he views success is obedience. Did we do what we were asked? So you heard I was at a soccer tournament. And the thing about coaches is coaches don't look at just the result that's happening in the moment, right? So you could be winning the game, but the coach might not be happy. Why? Because you're not playing the way that the coach wants you to play, because what's the coach shooting for? He's not shooting for uh, an exhibition win in Hawaii. He's wanting the ultimate goal of the season is to win a provincial banner, right? So actually, during one of the half times, we were up 5-1, and I got after them. It seems harsh, right? Like, why would you get after them if you're winning 5-1? Because they were playing in all the wrong ways for how they know we need to play if we're going to beat um, one of our chief rivals who won provincials last year. The way that they were playing was completely opposed to the game plan we had set out. They're like, oh, this game is easy. We're just going to play in a way that isn't going to set us up for success down the road. So, coaches... In, in the same way that coaches are thinking bigger picture, God is thinking even way bigger picture than a coach because he sees all, all of it, right? And sometimes he might ask us to do small things, just like a coach might ask, maybe, maybe there's a superstar, and, and the coach might say, hey, t- today I need you to play stronger defense. Dial back the offense, play stronger defense. And the player might not want to do that because he thinks, well, well how's that contributing? That's, that's kind of a small thing. I don't want to do that. But actually, that might lead to the team's success. It's the same thing with God. We might think, oh, that small thing, is, it seems so trivial. But it might actually lead to the very thing that God is crafting in his bigger kingdom picture and narrative. Right? So don't despise the small thing. If God asks you even to take a small step of obedience... Step out and do it. And here's the other thing that I've noticed in my own life. The more I say yes to the small things, the bigger things he gives me. If I'm faithful in the little things, he gives me more. If I'm not faithful in the little things, and I can't be trusted in that, why would he give me more to do? So just, just take even that small step of obedience. You never know. I, some of you heard me uh, a few months back tell the story about about how we, one time at one Christmas, we always give gifts to Jesus, and, we just, and our boys said, this year, we feel like the Holy Spirit is saying, give cake. Some of you heard me tell this story, right? And anyways, this story of just saying yes to giving the cake, when normally we gave something much bigger and worth way more money, we said yes to the cake, we're like, this, I'm thinking this is crazy, but the cake turned into like this big elaborate party that happened for years to come, and uh, orphans ended up getting jobs as chefs and working for the UN, and crazy things happened out of that that were like, pfft, blew my mind. 
all because we bought like some like $10 cake, like, ooh, right? Seemed like nothing. But my boys were like, no, dad, we really feel Holy Spirit is saying, buy a cake. And that cake had, like, it's still having implications today. Like, there's people who still have jobs and things they're doing. And there's uh, people that were, got involved, like the chef that got involved in building the cake still works closely with that orphanage, bringing in all kinds of funds for them to this day. Like, it's, like, I could go on and on about all the kingdom implications buying that silly little cake had. But this is how God works. So even the little things, if we say yes to it, that's success. And we don't understand the bigger picture. I could have never imagined the bigger picture that God was crafting that day. Okay. Here's something Beth Borum says in her book. She's talking about dreams that God puts on people's hearts. And it's in her book called Starting Something New, which is an awesome book, by the way. Highly recommend it. She says, bubbling up within them is the spark of an idea, an innovative unction in the spirit, for which they often feel some trepidation, some fear, right? As well as great interest and attraction, right? So many times, I can't tell you how many times in my life that God has put like kind of like a dream or call on my life, and I'm like, oh, being a part of that would be so cool. But also, God, it kind of freaks me out because I'm not good enough to, to pull this off. Like, there's something about God's call that it's like, oh, that, that would be amazing. But also like, oh my goodness, I don't think I'm ready for that. Right? Like, Moses is a great example from Scripture, right? Like, God says, hey, I want you to go and, and set my people free. And Moses wanted that right from when he was young. It's actually why in his own, in his own sinfulness killed the Egyptian that was a pressing his people. He has this idea right from when he's young that his people should be set free. And so when God calls him to that, he, he's not like he thinks, oh, my people being set free is a bad idea. But he's like, oh, but God, I'm not a really, I'm not really a very good speaker. Like, uh, are you sure you got the right guy? Like, I'm kind of, like, I really love the idea, but I'm maybe not good enough. Like, often this is God's call. But, but here's the, the words that the Holy Spirit has spoken over me time and time again when I felt like I wasn't good enough, which, by the way, is a lot, full disclosure. The Holy Spirit says, Brian, in me, you're enough. In me, you're enough. Yeah, you don't feel like you're ready to step out and do this thing. In me, you're enough. I'm going to go with you. And that's what he says to Moses. He says, hey, I'm going to go with you. The all-powerful God is with you. I got this. And oh, by the way, I'll send Aaron, and, and this is how he does. God, God often sends team with us to work with us. But here's the cool thing. It's not about you and whether you're good enough. If God calls you to something, he'll help you. He'll be right alongside you in the journey. He promises that. So here's my question. What might the Spirit be bubbling up within you? What kind of dreams, what kind of emotional imagination, ideas are stirring in your head that you know it's kind of been stirring in your, in your head and your heart for a while, but you're just like, you're not quite sure what to do with this. Rose, you remember this. Rose had this dream of like, I really want to help newcomers to Canada, and I, and I want to I give my life to that, but I don't know how that's going to look or how that's going to be, and she started to share that with myself and, and a group of people, and that's how Oasis Ministry was birthed, and now we see like how God is working in all kinds of newcomers to Canada's lives because of this, and people are being blessed, and people are being shown the love of God. And it was because Rose had this thing that the Holy Spirit was just stirring in her and it was bubbling up in her. And she had the courage to be like, okay, Jesus. And, I don't, and, and, and there was, it, it didn't come right away, but eventually the Holy Spirit provided. And now we're seeing the fruits of that in our church. And this is how the Holy Spirit works, right? Years back, I think it was like eight years or more ago, God put a put a, this dream bubbling up in me that, that we were somehow supposed to plant these microchurches in the apartments. And it was years before it came to pass. But now we see we have two of them. 
right? This is, this is how God works. He, he starts to stir and bubble something up in you, and you think, you know, could this be possible? I don't know. She's, Beth Borum also says this. She says, I have a growing sense that many people live with creative, spirit-inspired ideas stirring inside them, but have little to no clue, and sometimes courage, how to pay attention and nurture those dreams. So here's a question on that. What next step could you take to nurture that which you sense God might be laying on your heart and mind? What, what small step could you take towards it? Maybe it's as simple as just sharing it with somebody. Hey, God's been stirring in this. What do you think? Could you pray with me about this? What do you think about that? What next step could you take to move towards saying, to giving yourself to whatever it is that, and, and, and pursuing this thing that God, you feel like God is laying on your heart? And I love this last one. The God I've come to know over my adult life is a God who is more interested in the formation of my personal personhood than my personal comfort. Now, this is really important because in Canada, I actually think our biggest idol is comfort. We are the most insured nation in the entire world. Don't interrupt my comfort and my safety. Right? And... If you're, if you're in insurance, sorry, I'm not trying to put you down. Just saying, like, this is our mentality, is like, we have to be comfortable. We have to be safe. But God is more interested in the formation of your personalhood than your personal comfort, right? In fact, we, we love our comfort so much, we had to create a saying, move out of your comfort zone, Right? Like, that's how much we love comfort. We had to create a saying that talks about what it's like to move out of that. He said, as she continues, she says, he's more interested in who I am than the outcome or achievements of my life. His concern is whether through the circumstances of my life, I'm becoming more like Jesus as I become my true self. The person that Jesus created me, you, to be. Jesus' invitation is not a call to a life of comfort or ease, but a life filled with risk-taking obedience to him that will have meaning and value for all of eternity. I can tell you this. When I was a young teen, working on the farm, shy. Yeah, some of you, that surprises you. Shy, definitely would not ever be on a stage in front of people. I could not imagine the places God would take me, the things he would allow me to be. I would have never imagined being, going to places like Myanmar and being part of a, a a ministry that transforms entire villages holistically. Like, I wouldn't have even, wasn't even on my radar, right? And like, I could tell you all kinds of other things that have blown my mind that God has called me and, and empowered me to do that I just like wouldn't have ever imagined. But sometimes it's also been really hard. And there's been days, honestly, where I didn't want to do it. But it's not a life of comfort or ease, but a life filled with risk-taking obedience to him that has meaning and value for all of eternity. Because here's the thing, even when it's hard, I wouldn't trade it for the world. So here's the last question I want to leave you with. Will you answer, will you answer the call of Jesus to be a worker for his kingdom? Here's how I want to end today. The worship team's going to come. We're going to sing a song together. But I'm going to make myself available. Pastor Robin's going to be available. Any, any other pastors or people that uh, rose, maybe if you want to make yourself available, uh, uh, elders who want to make yourself available, I would love, I would love, it would be my joy and privilege if 
the Holy Spirit's stirring something, bubbling something up in you, I would love for you to come and share it with me and for us to pray about it or to share it with one of these other people who will be up here at the front and just pray about it. Or if you've never given your yes to Jesus, to follow him, to give him your life, or to fully give him his life and say, yes, I'm in for whatever you have for me, I'd love to pray for you for that too. So I'm going to be sitting here. I'll be available. Um, Robin, others will be available. And we'd love to just pray with you to hear what God is stirring inside you and just encourage you in that. And so uh, let me just pray for us. Then we'll worship together and I'll be available as, with the others here at the front for anyone who wants to come pray about this. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you use people, ordinary people, God, Thank you that you have a call for each of us to join you in your mission. And Jesus, I just pray that you would continue to stir and lay dreams and vision for what you want us to do, both individually and as a church, on our hearts. May you continue by your spirit to just lay that on our hearts and minds, God, and give us the courage to say yes to you, Jesus, in the things that you have called us to do. I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.